Hey everybody, this is Nick Baldwin, and today I'm being joined by the head coach of the New England Cartel, Tyson Chartier. He, of course, trains and manages some of the top UFC contenders in the promotion, Calvin Cater, Rob Font, the latter of whom just picked up a huge win over Cody Garbrandt this past weekend in the UFC Fight Night main event, and Tyson's here to talk all about it and more. Tyson, how are you? I'm good, man. You know, it's a uh... You get on the other side of those wins, and uh, the next week's always that much more enjoyable. I know. I, I'm sure you don't mind doing these interviews when you're talking about a, a big win. Um, first of all, just can you put into words how important and how big of a win beating a former champ like Cody Garbrandt is for Rob Font? Yeah, you know, it's, it's huge for Rob's career. You know, he I feel like that Marais fight, he finally got the monkey off his back. He beat the short, stocky Brazilian. You know, he lost three in a row to those guys, and he got it back, and then – you know, that allowed him to take the step up against someone like Cody Garbrandt. And not only did he get his first main event, but, he, you know, he beat a former champion. And he did it in, like, such convincing fashion that I think now the masses uh, are, are starting to realize, like, oh, who's this Rob Font kid? Yeah, no, for sure. Um, what, what did you think about the performance overall? Now, obviously, um, you are you're you're in, you're in a unique spot where, of course, you might be a little critical of your fighter, but obviously, he's your fighter, so you're super happy for him. But I mean, in, objectively, this was a great, great performance. What did you make of it as the coach, as the guy in the corner? Yeah, our, our, our team motto at the cartel is to try to learn off our wins. You know, they always say you win, you learn, and and that's true. You you should learn off your losses and. And um, but we're, we're trying to figure out ways to learn off our wins. And, and part of that is being hypercritical of every performance. And, you know, we have 25 minutes as coaches to dissect and and look at. And, you know, right off the top of our, you know, right off the top of our head, you got to look at like, hey, listen, maybe a little bit better with our takedown defense. And, um, you know, uh, that's something that we'll keep working on. And I, and I think, you know, maybe his takedown defense didn't look as good in that fight as it really is. I think Cody just really had some nicely timed shots, but when the shots weren't as nicely timed, Rob was defending fairly easy. So, um, you know, that's obviously being critical, but that's still something that we need to work on. And, you know, we did, we did hit a little bit. I think Cody, you know, almost landed at like a 50% clip, you know, which is what we did too. I think it was very similar. Both guys were around 50% ratio of uh, landing. And, um, you know, so maybe we can be a little bit better defensively, but that that's our job is to be super critical and, you know, step back as a friend and as a fan and be proud of, uh, of our fighter. But uh, at the same time, uh, we'd be doing them a disservice if we just said like, Hey, that was perfect. Cause there's no performance that's perfect. You can always be better. And our job is to parlay that into the next camp and say, Hey, listen, like that fight could have gone different. You know, one, one more mistake. It could have been the mistake that cost us the fight. So, you know, we just have to try to go in and, and, and perform as flawless as possible. And, and you don't do that by just, resting on your laurels and thinking like all right we got it all figured out we did everything great we just beat a former champion in cody garbrandt now let's just do the same thing next camp we have to parlay that performance into a better performance next time you mentioned that rob landed at something like a 50 percent clip and and that reminded me of the striking stats which were pretty insane i, I think it was the biggest differential between him and cody in a bandmate fight ever in UFC history, and it was the second most landed significant strikes in a Bantamweight contest in the UFC. When you hear those numbers, like, I mean, numbers don't mean everything. Maybe you don't read too much into them, but it has to make you feel pretty good about the performance, I would imagine. Yeah, especially, you know, Rob's first five-round fight and the fact that he was able to put up the volume like that, like a, a record-breaking volume, and, and he was still fresh leaving the fifth round. So, you know, yeah, some of that is that we were kind of drivers, you know, driving the boat the whole fight. So we're not going to get as tired as the guy who's not driving. But at the same time, like, you know, Rob stayed disciplined, landed a bunch of shots over five rounds. So he's going to have, you know, crazy confidence in his cardio moving forward um, and his ability to, you know, stay on the offensive, to keep his foot on the gas pedal all five rounds. So you get that takeaway. But, um, yeah, I, I mean – you know, it didn't feel like that when we were watching the fight, you know, it didn't feel like it was a, it was weird. Cause you know, you, you have the, you watch on TV and it always looks a little different than when you're there. And when you're there, you knew, we knew we were winning, but you know, when we saw the stats after we were like, wow, I didn't, I didn't know it was that much more that we landed <laughs> than he did. Yeah. Um, th was there ever a point in the fight? Like I, maybe in the first half or maybe sometimes towards the end where you kind of figured, yeah, I mean, Rob has this in the bag. Um, you're, you're never, you, you know, you never want to count out the opponent, especially when it's someone like Cody Garbrandt who has a, a ton of power, but 
to me, and I think to a lot of people, like even by the second round, it, it kind of felt like, hey, Cody's going to have a tough time to to get to 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 come back from this. Um, w- w- did you ever get to a point where you were kind of like, hey, Cody's going to need a, a hail mary to to beat us tonight? Yeah, I think once we left the second round, I knew that Cody was going to have to. It, it wasn't going his direction, and he was starting to get tired. So it was kind of like a snowball. It was just going to keep getting better in our uh, in our favor. Leaving the first round, I thought maybe we lost the round just because of the takedowns, because you can never tell. And I guess two of the judges had us winning it, but um, you know it was a close round. He got he secured those takedowns and and got a little bit of top pressure. Didn't do much with them, but still he you know he, he was able to get some well, well nicely timed takedowns. And, um, you know, get a little bit of control. But I think there was like, maybe it was like two minutes left in the first round. Um, and Rob hit a front kick up the middle and just caught to- Cody right in the chin. And you could see Cody's demeanor change. And immediately he comes back, he dropped his level and he shot. And you're like, oh, he doesn't like that. And that's something we knew going in. We thought that, that would be a sweet spot for us is, uh, you know, those teeps up the middle or the push kicks. And um, we thought, you know, Cody tends to attack on straight lines. He kind of just rushes. And so we thought that would be a good way to, aside from our jab, is uh, to manage distance a little bit and uh, and do some damage. You know, Rob's rocks guys in the past with that, you know, uh, you know, almost got knockouts with that kick. And, and we thought it would be a sweet spot for, you know, Tony tends to rush in with his head down on a straight line. And we figured if we landed one or two of those, it will probably be really – you know, he'd resist doing that again and maybe it open up our jab a little bit more. And I think if you look at the way the first round went, it was pretty even, you know, like he was, you know, it, the striking, no one was saying we were dominating the first three minutes of the fight. I think we were winning the exchanges. We were landing the better punches, um, but Cody was still in it, you know, and then then all of a sudden, I think it was like a minute and 50 left in the first round and Rob landed a push kick like right up the middle, caught Cody at the chin. Cody kind of went backwards and then he, and then he, he kind of wrestled. It was a well-timed shot. He still got the the takedown. But right there, I was like, okay, we got him. You know, I felt like if we could force him into panic wrestling, I think he was going to get tired, and um, and and that was going to, uh, you know, just kind of have a cumulative effect over the fight, and then just like like I said before, snowball on him. But um, his demeanor changed once we landed that first kick, and then come back out in the second round, and it was like he was so much easier to push backwards and and move away, and then our jab just started landing and landing and landing, and then it was like. He was just getting more tired. And then um, I, I really think that was like a pivotal moment in the fight. And um, yeah, it, it was just, you know, those are the little things in fights that maybe the crowd or fans or other people that aren't in the camp don't notice. But to us, that was a huge momentum swing. You mentioned earlier that you thought maybe Cody won the first round. Um, what did you think about one judge having it 48 47? I didn't understand that. I heard 48, 47 and, and I was just like, holy crap. Like, is this going to be a split? Like, I don't know, man. I heard that and I'm like, are we going to get hosed here? But then when I heard 50, 45, I was like, All right, we definitely, you know, we got that. Cause it was like clear that we won the fight, but you just never trust judges. And, you know, you see people like, I, I still feel like one of the big robberies was Courtney Casey got robbed a few months back. I felt bad for her. I thought she clearly won. Um, you know, just, just wanky judging in Vegas and um, well, most commissions anyway, not just Vegas, but, yeah, I don't, I mean, I got to assume they probably thought he, that Cody won the first and the fifth maybe, which I don't even understand how you could say that he won the fifth round because he he came out for the first minute guns blazing, but still, you know, landed a couple shots, but then we still pieced him up pretty good in the fifth round and I think controlled and dictated landed the better shot. So I don't know, man, maybe it was a uh, the judge sitting on his corner side. I don't know, like it's, you know, judges are going to do judges things. Yeah. Know? No, they they are. What wasn't uh, maybe the worst scorecard we've ever seen, but definitely def, that that fight was not forty eight forty seven. So it was a pretty bad scorecard. Um, Rob said after the fight that he he feels he has the best jab in MMA. And of course, there's no real way to to measure this, but um, do you feel that way as well? And and if so, what makes his jab the best? I've been saying it the very first round I ever sparred with Rob back in two thousand nine. This is when I was like. I already had a few fights under my belt and he was just starting to train with the team. I don't even know if he'd ever really done MMA sparring yet. And um, we invited him into MMA practice and he'd been watching us train. And the very first round I did with him, like he caught me with like three jabs. And then, you know, I was able to take him down and stuff because he didn't know what he was doing yet. And um, I just remember after the round ended, I kind of dabbed him up and I was like, hey man, like you have a really good jab. Like you, you should use it more. And then, so we've always known that he's got just a naturally good jab. He's got, you know, he's got long range for 35. He's got good reach. He flips it out there. There's no tell. Uh, so we've always known that. It's just 
sometimes it takes a little bit time to, you know, really kind of hone in your weapons and, and keep them, you know, get them really sharp. And he's building a foundation around it. And he said that in the post fight press conference or maybe in the pre fight is that, you know, it's always been about the jab. It's just we're trying to figure out everything around it to support it. And I feel like it's finally, finally coming together. Um, I've been saying for years that he's got the best jab in the division. And I think him and Calvin have two of the best jabs in the UFC. And, um, yeah, it's semantics to say who's got the best jab, but I think if you look at that performance, it's I think anybody could argue that he uses it just as good, if not better, than everybody else. Yeah, I'm um, kind of on that note. Um, Rob's rise to become a title contender happened relatively quickly because if you look at his, you know, two fights before these past two, you know, he beat. Uh, Sergio Pettis and Ricky Simone, two obviously quality wins, but not those wins that puts you into that top three, top five. Then he went and knocked out Marlon Rice, and now he just dominated Cody Garbrandt. So two, you know, a former champion and and a kind of like a longtime contender. Is this just a result of of gradual improvements in the gym, or or do you feel like something clicked over the past year or so? I think it's both. You know, I I think you know we do it a little bit differently on our team is where we build camps around the fighters and, and it's just you know you get four or five coaches just focused on and focusing on one fighter and building everything around them and and i'll i always use the analogy we're trying to fill holes in the boat and every camp we're trying to fill different things and and, and improve our you know not just like fill the voids and, and make our weaknesses better but we're trying to make our strengths better and um you know i think it's it's finally showing and i think it's having um positive results on the mental side too you know when you get that much attention from a bunch of different coaches and then you're surrounded by people in the room that aren't wasting your time you don't have like younger fighters kind of detracting from the coach's attention and you know you really do it's more like a boxing camp everything's you know we had a nine or a ten week camp here where everybody in the room was just watching rob focused on rob helping rob and there to just you know make sure that he's ready for this fight and um i i think you know on the other side is it's, you know, Rob's 33 years old now. He'll be, you know, 34 next month. And I think the, the mental maturity is finally meeting the physical. Um, and I kind of, I think I even said that in the pre-fight interview is, you know, this is the, finally you have the mental side and the physical side meeting and it's, it's resulting in what you've seen in the last two fights. He's going in there more confident. He's going in there and not overthinking and getting too nervous. He's just going out there to have fun, fight, listen, be disciplined, and just use his, use his skill set, not to put so much pressure on himself to perform a certain way. That's an interesting point you brought up about the fact that he's 33. And I, I think like a, most people would sort of consider like a fighter's physical prime to be like 20, 27, 28, 29 into their early 30s. Um, you know, not, it doesn't seem like too often you, you find a guy hitting his absolute peak when he's about to be 34. I mean, John Jones is 33, 34, and some people are thinking maybe he's, he's starting to be past his prime a little bit. Um, is there like, how do you feel about just the fact that, you know, it, is 33 actually, you know, fighters prime and we just don't realize it like, or is Rob late to, to, to become into his prime? Like what, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I think everybody's fight is different. I think, you know, the the heavyweight seem to be like, well, the average age, like a year ago, the top 15, yeah. 34 years yeah. old. So they tend to, to last a little bit longer. Um, you know, I think the lighter weights you see a little bit younger because I think a lot of them are kind of based around being quickness and athletic and stuff like that. But if you look at Rob's game, you know, he didn't get into martial arts until he was 20 years old. So he doesn't have... You know, like, you know, we just shot Cody Garbrandt, who was wrestling since he was probably four years old. He's got years of wear and tear on his spine and, and his joints. And, you know, you're, you're kind of limping through camps. Rob's been super healthy his whole career, knock on wood, um, except for the ACL injury, you know. Um, so he doesn't have those miles on his body. And I think he's, you know, if you look at probably his internal age, there's a way they can do that, right? Uh, I think I've seen another Biggest Loser. Like you're 34, but your inside is 60. <laughs> I think Rob's like the opposite <laughs> of that. He he's gonna be 34, but I think he's really like hitting his physical prime right now. Like he doesn't have a lot of miles on his body. It's not like he played football for 20 years or wrestled for 20 years or anything like that. So he's got he he's he's healthy. He's in shape, and I also think for for a 35er, he's not relying on his athleticism to be quick. He's not lying on one punch power or being the faster guy. He's lying on, he's relying on like, you know, fu basic fundamentals, you know, good footwork, 
a long jab. His footwork is based around being faster because Cody is clearly faster than us. Um, it's not about being the quicker hand speed because Cody was probably quicker than us and, and Cody probably has better power than we do. But it's about like using good, solid, basic fundamentals and then using those to pick it apart. And um, Rob's been showing that he can do that. So I don't think he's – I think he's still he's still improving, you know, which is kind of scary. But and I think you've seen that in his last few fights. He still is getting better. So uh, I'm not – that's not something that we're really thinking about as a team. Like, oh, you're 34. We're going to start declining. I think he's still getting better. He's still getting – he's faster. He's stronger. Um, he's still getting better at the at the weight cuts, at the diet. You know, every, everywhere's improving. So it's like it's scary to see where he's going to be at in two years. Yeah. Um, one thing that Michael Bisming mentioned on the broadcast was the fact that Cody, you know, late last year, he was just ha he, he had a pretty severe bout with COVID, um, uh, quite a few sort of long lasting symptoms from it. Um, and and B Bisming's point was that, you know, just to keep that in mind, not to take away anything from from Rob's performance, how good he looked, but um, just the fact that, hey, maybe Cody's cardio was impacted by by his COVID diagnosis or, or things like that based on what you saw um you know being at the fight and 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 being in rob's corner do you feel like that was cody as at his best or or is there something to think about with him having covid last year um it's hard to say because you know we've never shared the cage with cody before so and it's hard to compare cody at you know 27 to cody at 29 so i, I you know it's hard to say like but i just knew that I'd be lying if I said it in the fifth round, I wasn't staring at the clock hoping to move faster because he was still dangerous. Yeah. Um, you know, I just think, you know, Cody, he's a former champ for a reason. The guy is super fast. He's got good wrestling. He's got great power. Um, you know, I was really impressed with how, the lead up to the fight, how professional he was, his whole team. And then even after the fight, how, you know, humble and defeat he was because some guys can be sore losers and or sore winners. And I, I think... You know, it was nothing but respect from our side of his. He was, you know, super respectful throughout the whole process. He was super respectful after. Um, you know, it seems like, you know, he really, you know, he really does, like, want to be a good father, which I respect that. And, you know, watching the embedded and stuff and him being with the son. And, and, you know, that has a soft spot for me, you know, in particular, you know, because I get, I get little boys. And, um, you know, we just want what's best for him. You know, it, it's, it's when you go through these, you know, these fights and, and someone has to lose, but um, I think it's always easier to lose when you lose to someone that wins humbly. And, and I think Rob was humble as a, as a winner too. So, um, you know, we wish him nothing but the best moving forward. I, I, I hope if it was impacting his cardio that they can get that figured out and he can be a, you know, an even better Cody Garber at the next fight. But um you know, Michael Bisping, because a lot of people are asking us, like, oh, did you think the, the, the commentators were giving them an excuse and this and that? I was like, no, they're just doing their job. Commentators, is, it's hard because no matter what you say, one side is going to get mad and the other side is going to be like, that was awesome. So I think, um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I just think it was, it was very similar to the Max Holloway Calvin Cater fight. Like, I, I don't, I don't think it mattered what shape Cody came in last Saturday night. I just think Rob, it was Rob's night. And I think that was the best Rob font we've ever seen. So I don't know how much of a difference it would have made because Rob was just on. And I think people, you can see that when you're watching a, when you're watching a performance and you see like, holy crap, this is, we're watching something special. And, and that's how I don't, I know bias, but that's how it felt to me. Um, but I was on the losing side of that back in January when Max Holloway did it to Calvin. And it was like, I was proud of how Calvin competed. I, I mean, and we could have done a, a bunch of stuff different during that camp to prepare him better probably and that we're going to try to make sure we do in the future. But I don't know if it would have made a difference that night. You know, Max Holloway just was on a different level that night. He was, if this is basketball, you'd say he was in the zone. He couldn't miss. Um, and I think that's how Rob performed Saturday night. Yeah. Um, Rob, moving forward, finds himself in a bit of an interesting spot in the division just because he's number three. He was number three going into this fight. But Aldrin Sterling, the champion, is probably out for a number of, of months. Still probably going to fight Peter Yan in the fall. Then you have TJ Dillashaw coming coming back against Corey Sandhagen in July. And, it, you know, it, it's tough to say what the title picture looks like. It, it, it's a log jam right now at, at 135. I mean, Rob, in the eyes of most people, deserves a title shot. But we it, there's no clear definitive answer as to whether that'll happen with these other fights going on and still yet to happen. 
What do you think makes the most sense for Rob after this win? Right now, right now we just got to be patient. We got to see how things play out. And, um, you know, we can say what we think is the most sense for us. But at the end of the day, the UFC is ultimately the UFC and the champ are the ones that put together the plan. So, um, I don't, you know, I don't know how much say we're really going to have in it. But the one thing we can control is being patient. And um, I think right now we just got to see how this plays out. You know, one of those guys get hurt on the, on the, um, you know, the TJ and Corey card, that's our ticket to a title shot. You know, we can go replace whoever it is that pulls out, you know, and, and that's our job right now is to stay ready. The, you know, our, our motto is always focus on what you can control. We can't control what the UFC is going to do. We can't control who gets hurt, who gets the next title shot. We can't control any of that. But what we can do is we can be in the gym and we can be getting ready, keeping our weight low, being in shape and preparing to fight either TJ or Corey uh, on July 24th. And let's say that fight does happen. No one falls out. Um, could it make sense to fight the winner of that for the, you know, easily the, in, a, in a title eliminator um, just because that's in less than two months. And then you have Sterling Yen. We, that's still not booked, but probably not going to happen to like October is kind of what it, what it seems like. Um, it'd be a couple, you know, pretty quick turnarounds, but could that make sense for Rob? Fighting the winner of, uh, Corey and you know, TJ. Th- yeah, I mean, that because because I think a lot of people are going to say that we're behind the winner of that fight, right? Um, you know, there, there's going to be a lot of things that play out in that fight. Who's to say the winner of that fight doesn't win but get hurt, you know? like Yeah. But let's say all things considered, one of those guys goes, clear-cut winner, great performance, and he comes out unscathed and he's ready to fight for a title. It's like, all right, well, now that person has to wait until Jan and Aljo fight probably in November. Um and then how how quick of a turnaround like does does that person get hurt you know so i think you know there's a lot to play out it could end up being you know let's say everybody fights and no one gets hurt so you have like let's say Corey wins Corey wins in july now he's the number one contender right probably the people say he's number two we're number three he gets an extra shot but then he has to wait for aljo and Jan to fight in november let's assume that neither one of those guys get hurt so then now Corey's gonna go fight the winner when when's that gonna happen march or april and then now if we're going to sit around and wait past that, what are we looking at? Like 14, 15 months to sit around and wait for a title shot? I don't know how realistic that is. Yeah. Um, but the way MMA generally works is there's a good chance that one of these guys pulls out for the 24th. We replace it. We win. We're in the driver's seat. Or one of those guys wins and he gets hurt. So now even though he won, he's the one contender, we leapfrog him and, and, and then we're the backup for the title fight in November or we're the next in line, depending on injuries. Or another one is, let's say that Corey Sandhagen goes and wins in July, and then Sterling defends his belt. Again, it's a, you know he's the champ, but he gets hurt again. And and now they're going to do an interim belt between us and Corey. So, I mean, it's just like a lot of stuff that can play out. Um, I just saw speculation. It's these are like, I guess, good problems to have, right? You know, we're arguing and speculating over whether or not we're going to get a title shot or an interim shot or, or if we're going to have to wait too long for a title fight. Um, yeah. You know, all good problems to have. But at the end of the day, like it comes back to what I said earlier, is all we can do is focus on what we can control. And all that is is staying in the gym, keep getting better, and being ready to fight when they call our name. Just for what it's worth, and I know my opinion doesn't matter here at all. I have no pull with, with the matchmaking whatsoever, but I'll, I'll give it in anyways. Let, uh, assuming these fights happen with no injuries and, and you know you get winners and they happen, um, it probably for a Rob is ideal to me if Corey beats TJ and, and Sterling beats Yan because then the UFC might be a little hesitant to run that back given the fact that Sterling submitted Sandhagen in like a couple minutes less than a year ago. I, yeah. I still think they could book book that, but if everything goes to plan in terms of injuries and the fights happening, that might give Rob the quickest path to the title. I agree. That could uh, that could definitely. That's what I'm saying. Like we have to see but how everything plays who out. Knows? But yeah. yeah, I mean, it's stinks because you and know, I try to be obviously on the team font, and I want what's best for him. But at the same time, you got to be objective about this. And and if the shoe was on the other foot, um and we were number two and we go and beat TJ, like how could anybody dare leapfrog us, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's tough, you know? And then, yeah, it's all tough, you know, cause you got like, it is. TJ's come back from breaking the rules. 
Jan's rematch after breaking the rules. Like, so it's kind of like, it's just, <laughs> I don't know, man. It, 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 it's a bit of a mess. And, it, yeah. So it's, it's, uh, a, it's a bit of a mess. Let me ask you this though. Of, of the three guys ranked above Rob right now, Aljamain Sterling, the champion, Peter Yan and Corey Sandhagen. Who does Rob match up best against? Of course, as his coach, you think he beats them all, which is, is very possible. But if you could pick one of them just because you think that's the best matchup for Rob, who is it? I think Jan is the probably the clear clear path to victory. Is you know, we just gotta use our length, box him up, not let him wrestle. Because obviously Jan's got good wrestling too. He just never has to use it. You saw him against Sterling. Um you know, and then I go back to that Jimmy Rivera fight where Jimmy Rivera was in that fight the whole time, just a couple of punches where he got dropped. It was very competitive. And, um, you know, Jimmy Rivera's got, like, I'm not going to say as good as Rob, but he's got a similar style of boxing, heavy approach with, um, you know, good pressure and, and he's got good hands. And um, he, he had some a little bit of success with Jan. So I think uh, Jan's probably the best matchup for us. The other guys are a little bit more complex to solve. I think uh, Sterling's got a good wrestling background, some good grappling, and he's unorthodox on the feet. And, uh, you know, Corey Sanhagen, he's obviously got good jiu-jitsu. He's long. He's rangy. He knows how to use it. He's unorthodox. So both those fights are a little bit annoying to prepare for, but um, so are we. So, I, I, yeah, yeah, I'd say, like, if we had to pick which one we'd rather fight, I, I would always say probably Jan, just because I think it's, you know, you know what you're getting. Yeah, I know we've been we've been going on for for a, a while now. I wanted to take this opportunity real quickly though to get an update on Calvin Cater. Um, you mentioned it earlier. He's of course coming off that fight with Max Holloway in January, and you made a, a pretty big deal about it just in in terms of making sure he fully recovers from that fight and, and making sure he's not getting back in there too soon. So where is Calvin at right now? I mean, how how is he doing? Um, and and sort of what's the latest on on him? Yeah, he's he's in the gym. He's doing two days. He's uh, we're not doing contact yet, and uh, I've said from day one we're gonna not do any contact for six months. So that brings us, uh, you know, we got another mid July. So you know, mid July we'll start getting into contact training. We told the UFC that, you know, end of September or October we're good to book, and um, you know, so now it's just about getting back in the. You know, he's been in the gym the whole time, and Rob will be getting back in the gym soon, and get, you know, just starting to, uh, you know, just work work on the next one but yeah he's he's clear he's, he's good to go um you know we're just being super safe and uh, i think we're doing the right thing and and just giving him a little bit of a break because you know he doesn't want a break but um i think he i think he just earned it you know he he'd been in fight camp for like two straight years um he had some dings up with his hands and his nose kept breaking and stuff like that so now this will be the first time that he comes back into uh, a fight he's not injured you know um we've been kind of limping through the last few fights and i think now uh you'll finally get to see a calvin cater that's physically 100 percent and um you know i think that'll be a dangerous calvin cater so if he starts getting back into contact training in july do you have any sort of idea i mean you're not thinking about his next fight yet i would imagine but based on that then he needs probably a two-month cap like could he get back in there by like end of fall? Do you think? Do you have any yeah, idea? That, yeah. I said end of September or October. Those are okay. where I'd be looking at. Before that, it would just be rushed. And you know, I think uh, you know he, he's he's just done a really good job in the UFC since he got there. And you know, taking short notice fights, fighting down in the rankings, fighting you know main events halfway across the world. And um, you know, I think he's done a good job. And and he's pretty much done everything the UFC's asked him to do and he's performed well and I think he's earned a little bit of uh time to prepare you know he just comes off of uh you know a, a loss against you know one of the best performances that we've ever seen in, inside the octagon I think he uh he definitely earned the right to have a full camp for his next one and, and come back on his terms again I'm, I'm sure you haven't really given this a whole lot of thought yet but do you have any sort of idea what level of opponent you want him to fight next? Of course, he lost to the former champ, number one contender, one of the best in the world. Holloway last time out, like, are, are we still thinking a top 10 guy? Yeah, I think when you're sitting at number five, you know, there's a lot that could play out over the next couple of months. You know, you have, let's say, Ige goes and beats Zombie. You know, you, then you got to think that uh, that probably bumps us up, right? I think uh, Zombie's number four, we're number five right now. So if Ige turns around and beats Zombie, I don't think you can justify having Ige leap us, right? So that would bump us to four. And then let's say Calvin, K, you know, uh, Max Holloway goes and just 
starches Yair Rodriguez, then there could be an argument of, okay, well, maybe we should be ranked above Yair too. So somehow we could slide into number three without fighting. And then we'd be looking at number three, who do we fight next is, you know, not a ton of options, you know, you know, maybe you end up fighting the, you know, just, and then get the title fight in September. So like, you know, depending on when they book us and who's available, you know, it, it's probably we'll have to fight backwards because there won't be a lot of guys ahead of us. But, um, you know, I think, you know, Calvin's ready to take on anybody. We'll just see what makes sense and who's available once uh, once we're ready to sign a bout agreement. For who do you sure. want to Tyson, see? Him? Who do you want to see him fight? That's a great question. I I, I don't really know. I mean, I, I'll take a second and pull up the rankings. I mean, there's so many great options at, at 145. Like, there's so many... I mean, the division is one of the best in the UFC, and so I think Calvin could fight kind of anybody. And I'm putting in – not spelling UFC right, so give me one second. Um, featherweight. Um, I could see him fighting I, – I mean, the winner between – well, I guess he probably wouldn't fight Ige if he beat Zombie just because that happened pretty soon. I could see him fighting Josh Emmett. I, I know Emmett is still recovering a little bit, but – I mean, that seems like a matchup that could make sense. Um, otherwise, maybe the winner between Zombie and Ige, like especially if it's Zombie. Um, I don't know. I, I think there's a few good options for Calvin. Like I said, 145 is stacked, and I think you put him in there with almost anybody from 1 through 10, and it's a pretty interesting matchup. So, Yeah, no, I think it's, That's my there's going to be some good fights there. And it's, you know, both divisions, 35 and 45, are going to have a lot of uh, questions answered over the next few months. Yeah. Well, Tyson, thank you so much for taking the time. As always, really appreciate it. And congratulations again on Rob's big win over the weekend. Thank you. All right.